Welcome to Keep the Hotel Empty. I'm your host, Eric Paul. In studio today, we are grateful to welcome in extraordinary voice talent and actor, Andrew Randall. Andrew will be immediately recognizable to many of you as he has voiced the famous Geico Gecko. In this episode, Andrew discusses his early days in England, how unexpected turns led to great journeys, and how he has used his resourcefulness repeatedly to turn his ideas and desires into reality. Please enjoy. Welcome to Keep the Hotel Empty. Today we've kept the hotel empty to welcome in voice talent, creative, Andrew Randall. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. So I understand you've got quite a breadth of a career, so I want to kind of get where we're at now. But I know you started doing this in 2009, so kind of take me a little bit how you got into this at that stage. Right. Um, I'd never considered anything like this, but uh, back then I was a freelance editor and writer. I used to work for a newspaper and uh, I was making my living reasonably okay uh, doing freelance work and had been for about five years. At some point in the previous past, I'd worked with a guy called Greg Bell, who is the host of Sirius XM's Radio Classic show, mm. uh, which is the old time radio stuff. So all the old shows, Dragnet and oh, cool. uh, The Lone Ranger and Superman even back then. He plays those, and he's been the host there forever. He's still there now. Uh, anyway, one day he phoned me up and he said, oh, look, I need a British voice to do some interstitials, the stuff in between the shows. Would you mind coming up? Well, you know, I'll get them to pay for you to come <laughs> up and uh, do some voices, and we'll have a drink, and it'll be great. Good excuse to go up and see my friend. Right. Uh, so I went up there, and uh, we did it, and we had some fun, and it was great. And uh, on the way back, I was thinking... Most of my friends were really irked at the fact that I made my living because, as they said, you know how to write. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Right. And I thought, what if I could make my living because I know how to speak? That would really tick them off. No kidding. So uh, I started chewing this over. And as the universe <laughs> tends to, excuse me, the universe tends to throw things at you, I think, when uh, the time is right and when the mood is right. And the very next week, I think, I got in the mail one of those um, brochures you get from the uh, local college, mm. who when uh, the semester's out in summer, they run all kinds of adult learning classes. And one of the classes uh, that they were running was learn to do voiceovers. <laughs> and I went, well, that's a bit on the nose, isn't it? Right. So I went and had a, had a look. Uh, I went there and uh, it was a pitch for someone selling their services, teaching people how to do voiceovers. Fine. But from that, I learned how the industry was operating at that point in time, which was dramatically different from even five years previously. Mm -hmm. um, back in the day, if you wanted to be a voiceover artist, you had to have an agent. And when you needed to do, do an audition, you had to go into a studio to do an audition. And can you imagine the time-consuming process? And if you imagine that most people never win more than one in 50 auditions, mm -hmm. what a te tedious life that must have been, right. except for the lucky few who were booked on a regular basis. But the whole world had changed, and everything was moving online. And at that point in time, there were a couple of major online voiceover sites where you could uh, pitch your tent, put up some demos, and apply to jobs. So I started doing that. And it took a, a little while before I kind of got the hang of things. Uh, what was also useful at the time was the cost of equipment has come down dramatically. Right. So I think I set up with uh, probably less than $500 worth of gear all in. Uh, and you can do that still today. Mm -hmm. and, and you'll still, and you'll get good quality, not like horrible quality. And I uh, got into my closet with some comforters from Walmart <laughs> and surrounded myself with these comforters and produced what was good quality sound, so much so that people would uh, come back to me and say, wow, your studio's really got a great sound. Can you tell me how that's, you know, how you're achieving that? And I go, Queen no. size. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that. I've yeah. got a bunch of comforters in my closet. It makes right. me sound like an idiot. Now I'm not embarrassed to say that. 
because uh, subsequent to that, I built out a full proper studio with the egg crate foam and all that stuff. And I sat in it and I'm like, this doesn't sound as good as in my, in, in my comfort aligned closet. And it didn't, it really didn't. So maybe one day I'll go back to that. But anyway, so I started doing that and uh, it took me a while to get the hang of it uh, as it would w with anyone. And right. so if I go back and listen to the things that I was recording in 2009, it's just dreadful. But the point is the market is enormous and continuing to grow. And there's a market for anyone's voice. And you might not think, uh, uh, again, back in the day, everyone was, you have to talk like, in a world, there is a meteorite coming. Yes, right. exactly. Right? And that doesn't exist anymore. Um, in fact, they want the more real, the better. So the fact that I was not very good at what I did sometimes worked for the person's job, whichever job they were looking for. Mm -hmm. But then you get better and better and better with time and practice and uh, kind of went from there. Um, and I picked up all kinds of interesting stuff. So what so. were some of the first gigs you did when you were out on your own, the, when, the, when it wasn't your friend calling you say, hey, I got one for you? Oh, back in the early days yeah. when I was not very good at it, yeah. website stuff. Uh, people always want, um, and still even more so today, they always want some kind of audio component to their website, uh, be it just a little, you know, a two-minute explainer for what their product does or what their service is. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, the big, that's the biggest market back then, I think, explainer videos, um, whereby they would run an animation or a little uh, bit of video, and you would do the voiceover underneath that. Gotcha. And that was mostly what I was doing back then. I so, picked up some character work and some animation work, but all independent kind of small time stuff. So when do you start to transition from that? Or what, what does it start to look like as you start to grow and you think, hey, I'm going to actually build a, a studio that maybe doesn't sound as good as my closet? Uh, well, I mean, it took, I'm going to say, for five years, I was barely treading water and uh, just making enough to, so to justify, years. keep going. And then uh, I realized that the way that I was doing business was incorrect. Um, the pay to play, what they call the pay to play sites, where you have to pay a subscription to audition for these jobs that are posted online. Mm -hmm. I was getting a 2% success rate on that. So one in every 50 jobs, 50 auditions, or two in every 100. Right. And I learned from talking to a whole bunch of other people on the site that that's excellent. Woof. And that, uh, you know, if you're getting that level of success, you are in the top 1%, top 1% or 2%. So what did that tell me? That told me that it's not sustainable because it took so long, it took all day to audition for these jobs every day. And yet I'm only winning one in every 50 jobs and those jobs weren't especially well paying. So, even, you know, I couldn't continue at that pace. So fortunately I'd, I'd done some research and I, had a, I have a bit of a business background anyway. So I knew that the only way to, to uh, income without the users. And uh, basically I went online looking for anyone doing in video production, animations, commercials, video games, whatever, audio books. And I gradually over time, every day I would pick up 10 people online, add them to my email list. Hmm. 10 people, add them to my email list. And over five years, that grows. I've now got 5,000 people on my email list. That you compiled solely on your own. Yeah, just by every day, spending an hour doing 10, every doing 10, doing 10, right? And it just adds up. Uh, and when I started marketing to them uh, directly and not wasting time on the pay-to-play sites, uh, that's when my business really started to pick up. Did having the work that you did or at least attempted to do on the pay-to-play sites help that happen, or you think you could have done that right out of the gate? Oh, I think the pay-to-play sites were an excellent training ground uh, because you can go on there and because there's such a wealth of different needs uh, in the marketplace, I wasn't making a fool of myself with someone at the top end of the market who might then remember me and go, oh, he's useless right? uh -huh. three years down the line. I mean, we're not going to bother even listening to him. So if I made a fool of myself, it was at the bottom end of the chain where it didn't matter so much. 
And also there were people who, you know, wanted a certain level of amateurish, amateurishness in the sound sometimes. Just because that was becoming more favorable in yeah. a marketing sense? Absolutely. And so uh, what it gave me was an opportunity to break into the market with that kind of uh, client base, but also to practice because um, well, you stick a mic in front of someone and they tend to do the same thing as they do when you put a camera in front of them. Mm. They don't behave naturally. And the key to being a good voiceover artist, especially these days, is to be natural in front of the mic. So originally you go in front of the mic and if you listen to my stuff from back then, it's, oh yes, so if you want to come and buy this drinking glass, come to our store today. It's lovely. <laughs> and it's really stilted and stiff. Right. And it takes a little while to, to be able to, to do this kind of fluidly and smoothly and naturally such that it comes out sounding uh, normal. And yet, there's a skill to that. Yet professional. Yeah. So what would you say were some of the things beyond just doing it repeatedly that helped you curb from the nice staccato speech to a nice fluid, I'm a believable guy? Oof. Uh, I listened to a lot of good people. Um, I would listen to, so I would go on these sites and you can see who's getting the most reviews. And so mm. you can see who's getting the most jobs. And so I would go and listen to their stuff and I'd go, okay, what are they doing that I'm not doing? And, mm. uh, I would listen and I, and you can, you can tell something's different about what they were doing. And so I would try and match what they were doing. And also I came across a guy, um, I, I was going to say, should I plug him? Well, I don't see why not. He, he does a great job. There's a guy online called Bill DeWeese mm -hmm. and he's a voiceover artist and he's been doing it for a few years longer than me. Mm -hmm. And I came across him quite early on. Uh, in addition to doing his own voiceover work, he also coaches so I'm not sure how much of his business is coaching and how much of his business is VO, but he does a lot of coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's very, very good at it in as much as there's no bullshit. Uh, he doesn't um, follow the, the normal voiceover route. Which would be? Uh, which would be go to an acting class, oh. uh, learn your dic diction and all this. He okay. says, no, that's nonsense. He goes, <laughs> he would tell you, Market directly, so that's what I was doing. Market directly, and uh, practice on the pay-to-play sites. So I'd done all this, uh, and here's how you get better and better. And he would release these free videos every week. He would send out uh, an email with a free video, and in that video, there was a lot of chat, and of course, a lot of nonsense. But there was always one piece of gold, and I would take all these pieces of gold that he would give for free. Uh, and that improved my technique and it proved, uh, the way, improved the way I did business uh, enormously. He was very useful. If anyone's interested in doing voiceover, look up Bill DeWeese on YouTube and go through all his free videos. Right. Uh, I, I highly recommend him as a, as a coach. He's excellent. So you were all self-taught, for want of a better term, with this entirely? Uh, largely, yes. I haven't had any uh, acting or, or drama lessons or anything like that or voice coaching lessons other than what I picked up through Bill. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. So did you do any practicing other than the practical practicing of shopping for gigs and auditioning for gigs? Do you sit there and speak to yourself or speak in a mirror or record yourself on your phone and listen back? Did you do anything like that? Good God, I'm far too lazy for that. <laughs> <laughs> I figured I'd pick it up as I go along. Yeah. <laughs> and sure enough, you do. I mean, obviously, that I'm betting that um, it's like with golf. I'm dreadful at golf, but I refuse to have lessons on the basis that um, – I don't want to be a pro. I'm never going to be. I'm never going to be as good as Tiger Woods. I'm never going to get on the circuit. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Fair um, enough. I just like going out and hitting a ball. Yeah. And so I refuse to have lessons because who cares how bad I am? I'm just going out there, hitting the ball, and then I go and have a beer with my friends in the clubhouse afterwards. That's all that matters to me. But I'm betting that just like in tennis, which I also refuse to take lessons for, <laughs> and I'm equally as bad at, I was once playing a guy who stopped me and said, your backhand is just dreadful. And I went, yeah, I know, I don't care. And he went, and he literally, here's the, here's the racket. He went, go like that. Turn my hand a quarter of an inch. He goes, now try. It improved my backhand a thousand percent. <laughs> so I'm betting that there are tips and tricks like that 
oh, sure. that I could pick up from someone who really knows their stuff. Um, and maybe well, I like should. the gentleman you did online. Yeah, and maybe I should, but nah. <laughs> Where where do you develop an ethos like that? Have you been like that your whole life? Like, I'll figure this out and trial by fire is my best way to learn? Or was this just now you're doing something new, we're going to do it in a new way? Uh, no, I've always been somewhat independent-minded. Um, um, perhaps to my detriment in some cases, uh, there are times when I could have learned from others perhaps quicker than me going about it the long route. It's quite possible I could have got to a point in terms of technique and um, skill much quicker had I taken some lessons from someone. Uh, there's no doubt about it, but I don't know, something in my stubborn psyche that says no. And ever since I was young, I, I've tended to go my own way and do my own thing. Did you approach writing like that as well? Uh, yes. Again, uh, well, except for I, I did get uh, schooled quite badly. I, I went to a, a reasonable school in England. I had a very good education. Uh, and so I considered myself a decent writer. Mm -hmm. And when I first came to this country, I was bouncing around looking for something to do. Didn't need a job per se. I was sitting on a little bit of money that I'd, I'd saved up. Mm -hmm. But I needed to do something. And uh, my wife and I, we just moved to the Keys. Uh, I was going to say, did you come to Florida first? Yeah, we did. Uh, we, uh, we moved to the Keys, although that wasn't where we started. We started in Bradenton, funnily enough. Um, but I'd met her in Key West. Ah. And uh, so we went back to the Keys after we'd done a little bouncing around. And I'm going, oh, what should I do? I'm looking in the paper. And there's jobs and jobs and jobs. And one of them was for the newspaper. And I thought, well, that sounds interesting. I want to do something interesting. And it was the bottom rung. It was uh, editorial assistant. I don't know if you know much about newspapers. Just in small But doses. editorial assistant is basically, you know, the lowest of the low and the lowest paid thing. Uh, so I went to this interview and uh, the guy was English, actually, the editor. So nice. may maybe that helped or it didn't help. But um, he's looking at me. Uh, I show up in a suit because back in my day, you show up to an in interview a in a suit. Yeah. And this is like a kid's job. And uh, <laughs> he's, he's like, why on earth do you want this job? It pays nothing. I went, because I've never done this. I've done all kinds of other things, but I've never done this. And I thought it might be interesting. And I don't need to make a lot of money, uh, but I just thought I might learn something and it might be fun. Right. And he said, all right then. So I did this uh, and it was fun and it was interesting. And I did learn some things, but of course, you know, you can't sit around doing the lowest of the low job forever. And so I decided I wanted to write. And so uh, I started pitching articles to him. And uh, this was when it got Just really unsolicited? Yeah, yeah. Because that's what I'm like. Okay. Uh, here, read this. I'm brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I would send him this article. And uh, he would come back. And let's say I'd written a thousand words. He would say, that's great. I need 700 words. I said, I can't cut 300 words out of that. He goes, yeah, you can. Do it. And sure enough, if you sit down and you focus on it, what he taught me was you can be much more succinct than you think you can. Mm. And so uh, the education from him on writing was astonishingly uh, good and eye-opening because I was a good writer. There's no, I'm not saying I wasn't a good writer. I was a good writer, but I wasn't a great succinct writer. Ah. And uh, he taught me how to do that. And so that was fascinating and uh, I've been grateful for that uh, skill that he passed on ever since. So how long did you do that in Key West? Uh, we were in Key West for two years, including the turn of the millennium oh. in 1999, uh, New Year's Eve. And uh, that was fun. That was extraordinary. At the time, uh, my brother had come over from England and he was doing his um, bucket list motorcycle across the country. Oh, sweet. And he met us in Key West, and this was going to be his kickoff point because I'd just picked up another job in D.C., just outside of D.C., as an editor for a nonprofit. And so we were winding up our time there. And so it's New Year's Eve. It's 1999. My brother's here. What are we going to do? It's got, and we're leaving soon. We're leaving the Keys probably for good. We'll never come back again. What are we going to do? We've got to do something good. So I had a lot of good contacts there working at the paper. So right. I phoned up all these people that I knew. And they're all, yeah, yeah, it's $500 a seat. It's New Year's Eve. $500 a seat. It's New Year's Eve, 1999. 
these are people I knew and did, did business with. I'm like, ah, <laughs> oh, you... And I don't know if you've been to Tirtha Keys or if you know much about Key West, but it's a very insular kind of uh, community. Right. And we, I say we, because I was part of it then, uh, we get very snotty about um, chains. And any chain restaurant or bar that tried to open up, we would boycott and we wouldn't, we wouldn't go and see. Uh, and just because that's what you did. Yeah. And uh, there was this one chain that take, that had taken a restaurant right on Duval Street, which is the main drag, mm -hmm. where the parade was going to come through on New Year's Eve. And they had the best location. And I called them up and I said, well, what are you doing? Everyone's doing these ridiculous set menus for hundreds of dollars. And I've got a crowd of people that I need to seat. Um, what are you doing? And they said, oh, we're doing normal menu, normal prices. Would you like us to rope you off a section? And I went, at the front on Duval Street. I went, thank you very much. Yeah. I'm <laughs> sorry for maligning you for the past six months. Yeah, <laughs> sold. Sold. And so we had literally the prime position on Duval Street for 1999 turning to 2000. That's nuts. Uh, yeah. And then the next day we left. <laughs> to go to DC? Well, actually, no, the second. We, we did have the day to get over the hangover. Yeah, but, right. But on the second, I went to DC, yeah. And to, then you were writing there. Then I was uh, a writer and editor for a nonprofit that was helping people get out of debt back then. And, and I did that for a couple of years. And then I went freelance for a few years. And then, then it comes the voiceover. Then comes the voiceover so by accident. Was yeah. the voiceover really the impetus of that just being like, hey, here's another something different fun I can do? Yes, absolutely. Uh, but also, mm, I say yes, uh, because ever since I left the UK, um, back in the UK, I was in regular jobs, regular business, um, but realized uh, that I hated that with a passion, <laughs> but, but never considered doing anything different. Uh, it was only my wife who said, who, you know, when I come home miserable from my job, which made me miserable every single day, she would go, well, why don't you quit? What was that moment like? When she said that? Yeah. It was like, didn't think about that. And I hadn't, it just had not occurred to me because you didn't do that. If you had a job, you did that job. Right. Unless and until they stopped you doing that job or you had another job. Uh, but to just quit, it just never occurred to me to quit. She said, well, you don't like it. Don't do that. She's quite smart like that. <laughs> um, and it sounds very obvious, uh, but most people, I think, are like that. I think most people drift through their lives doing whatever it is they do by accident. Right. I don't think they live a very purposeful life. And so I did that. And we were in the UK at the time. And I wrapped up everything I was doing there, sold the place that we were living in. Uh, and we came over here, started off in Bradenton, um, and then moved down to the Keys for a couple of years. And, and over the last 25 years, I've been trying to figure out what I'm going to do when I grow up. And I, I have no problem with that. And I've changed and done all kinds of different things. I, did, I started off at the newspaper, then did some uh, editing and writing for a company, did some freelance, on to voiceover. I've done some on camera work. I've done some acting. Um, I've done all kinds of things. Um, had a pool cleaning business for a little while. Um, and, oh, and I helped a guy make vegan soap. Because <laughs> you got to have one oddball amongst your oddballs. Yeah, because um, I'm, I'm somewhat mostly vegetarian anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and I met this guy who's a, a much more fierce vegan mm -hmm. than, than we are. We're, we're vegetarian slash want to be vegans but i'm not very good at it sometimes and because cheese because cheese and eggs and milk eh, it's not easy no. um but i do my best and that's all, you know that's all i can do yeah uh but he said soap is made from animal fat tallow right never occurred to me to think about these things and he said there's lots of soaps you can buy that's vegetarian and vegan he goes but they're all liquid uh but bar soap is that by far and away the largest market hmm uh, it's also significantly cheaper than all these fancy liquid vegetarian soaps. So I want to make a soap in a bar that's vegan, that's a reasonable price that the average person in the store can afford. I don't know how to do that. Can you? And I went, probably. <laughs> sure, why not? So uh, in six months, I took it from that to a product on the shelf. Nice. Uh, I won't take you through the boring process because it is a boring process. Um, 
But it was a fabulous product too. Everybody uh, who tried it, Veganu it was called, you can even find it somewhere online still. It's no longer being made, but um, it smelled brilliant and it was fabulous on the skin. Uh, my wife said it was better than anything for using as a shaving foam on her legs. Uh -huh. No rash, no nothing. Uh, everybody loved it. Uh, so we started pushing this to the usual suspects, the, um, you know, the whole food type, small independent veggie type grocery stores. But right. that's not sustainable in the long term. You have to get into a, a, a big, big box. Market. So I finally got hold of Walmart and the people at Walmart that were important um, to talk to. And they said, yep, yeah, uh, love it. Uh, but you need $2 million first year. I said, what for? They said, a uh, million dollars for stock for our stores and a million dollars you have to commit to advertising. I went, okay, wasn't my money. Yeah. Uh, so I went back to this guy who had some money, but I knew exactly how much he had. And I said, look, they want $2 million worth of commitment. And honestly, 98% of all new products fail. Uh, and this is the statistic. Right. I said, I said I, I, if you want my recommendation, it's not to gamble $2 million uh, on this. It's a great product and we gave it a great run, but I never realized that this was going to be the kind of commitment that the big guys would want. Yeah. And that's what they wanted. They wanted this kind of money. Uh, I said, look, it's in your court. I'd run, it's, it's, it had run its course for me. I'd taken it to where I was ever going to take it. I'm not. I don't want to run a company. I, I'm good at starting companies and getting them to a point, but I didn't want to run a company. So even if he'd have gone with it, I'd have, you know, moved on from that anyway. Right. But he decided he didn't want to risk that kind of money anyway. And so it just kind of died a death. But that was interesting too. So <laughs> it seems very much like you enjoy the process. Even yes. if it's boring and we don't want to talk about that part, I'm good with that because I think the underlying part of it is it's hard for people to enjoy the process. It's hard for people to want to do something new just to enjoy the hunt, you know? Where, yes. Where does that come from for you? Oh, I don't know. Um, is it perhaps because I've got a, a, um, a short attention span and I need to find something new to challenge me or something? I don't know. Uh, well, maybe there's a little bit of that, but also I'm very good with um, a routine too. Uh, in fact, I don't like it when my routine is, is messed with. Um, I had a job uh, for five years recently uh, that just ended in 21, beginning of 21 at, in the middle of COVID, uh, where I was doing voiceovers for a, a website that did uh, product comparisons. And every day he would send me 25 videos and I would voice 25 videos. A day? Yeah. Of good top, Lord. top 10 lists. But I'm very good at that. I'm very good at the routine and getting uh, things done in a very efficient manner. Okay. And also I can cold read, um, which means I don't have to pre-read a script. I can read a script usually perfectly first time without ever seeing it before. Um, and so that makes it easier for me to do. Um, so I could do a lot of work in a very short period of time. I'd say. So every day I would come and get in do these things and I, and I would I would go right after six of them I'll go take a break and then I go take a 15 minute break just to you know because you can't sit still for for eight hours a day because otherwise you lock up right in front of a microphone you have to pretty much sit still because you want to be at the same distance because that proximity effect when you're doing voiceover is well noticeable yeah so uh, I would do this and I loved the routine of it I kind of like it did get boring yes yeah, so there was some uh wrote element to it that did become tedious at times. But I kind of liked the fact that every day I knew I, I, what I had to do each day and I knew I was going to get paid this much every week, no matter what, and I didn't have to go trawling for business, which is the worst part of being a freelance. <laughs> that got rid of that one out of 50 routine. Oh, yeah. <sighs> that is the worst part of being freelance anything, having to go out hunting for business. Right. So I don't know. I, like, I do like figuring out how to do something. I do like the challenge of new business, um, or, although that's becoming less and less now. If, if I had my way now, uh, when I was younger, absolutely. Yeah, you give me a new business to do, fabulous. I'll get it up and running in six months and phew, uh, you'll be a happy man. Uh, and then I'll be off doing the next interesting thing. Right. Um, 
Now, though, I think I'm slowing down. And now if I had my ideal wish, I would just be performing in some way, shape or form because it turns out that, you know, it wasn't just, oh, this is a good gig doing voiceovers. I actually like performing. And, uh, and you didn't have any idea about that before you started this? Honestly, if I go back many years, it was there. Uh, I had teachers when I was at high school who told me I should go into acting. Uh -huh. uh, but I just wrote that off because you don't do that when you're, you know, when you come from my background, you go get a job and you make money. Right. You don't do something speculative like acting. Right. Um, but it was there and people had seen it. And uh, there was a time when I was uh, 10, 11, going from junior school to middle school. And my brothers had gone to this uh, somewhat prestigious private school in England, but they call it a public school and don't even ask why. <laughs> um, and it was, it was assumed that I would go too. And I did the entrance exam and passed. And back then you could get assistance to go there. My parents weren't wealthy by any means, uh, but they got assistance from uh, the government to send us cool. uh, if we passed certain exams. Nice. It was nice, yeah. And once two brothers are in, then the school gives you a bit of help too. Right. Um, so it was assumed I was going to go there, but I wasn't a appearing to be particularly happy about it. <laughs> and my mum said once, she goes, look, do you, do you want to go to a stage school? Because people, her teachers had spoken to her about it. And there were some very good stage schools in London. So they were prepared to take the money that they were going to spend on, on me at this school and spend it on a stage school. Hmm. And honestly, I chickened out. I should have gone. But then again, who knows what would have happened. Yeah, right, of course. Right. But from a, from a, from a who I was and what I was into kind of perspective, I should have gone to a stage school, but I chickened out. I went and took the easy route, went to a school where my brothers were and that I knew about, and I did that. Hated that school, by the way. <laughs> but that gave you but a little I bit of a, the grounds to get forward. I had a fantastic education. I'm not knocking them for that. I no, had no. a great education, but I just hate it. I just don't like rules and regulations and stuff. So take me to the first time you get to come back to that when you do some acting and performing and what mm -hmm. that felt like. Uh, it was kind of like a, oh... Yes, you do that, don't you? You're good at this. Um, this is really what you should have been doing for 20 years, you idiot, kind of. There was a bit of that. And so after I'd been doing VO for a couple of years, uh, we, at the time we were in uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. and they Major have a, market. Yeah, they have a reasonable market, and they also have a film and TV market. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, reasonable. And... Uh, so I thought, well, what if I go and do some on-camera work too? Um, totally unsolicited again. Totally unsolicited again. But I found out how you do that, and I picked up an agent. And uh, so I started going out and doing some auditions for some stuff. But I don't like the whole audition process. It's so inefficient and so ineffective. I quickly got tired of that. Um, because uh, it was back to the one out of 50 thing? Well, worse. Too much tire kicking? Worse than that. And... Uh, then, even then, there was no online auditioning. COVID brought online auditioning to the on-camera world, which is fantastic. Oh. Um, but back then, you did have to show up. Oh. And so let's say you're, you're, you're pitching for a commercial job. Um, you have to go to Deep Ellum or wherever they were casting in Dallas, which takes an hour. Mm -hmm. Wait there for an hour till you got your part. Do 30 seconds of your bit. Then an hour back, that's half your day gone. And you don't get paid for any of that. Right. And you've got to do that at least 50 times to get one job. Whew. So to, for me, that made no sense economically. We couldn't afford to do that. Uh, so I very quickly got tired of that and stopped doing that. But in the process, I picked up a couple of things. I got the lead of a, of a sitcom that this guy was doing. Uh, and he had a very interesting idea. You know those... Uh, I don't know if they still do them because who watches TV these days? But Rare. Uh, back in the day, late at night, you would see these long, long form infomercials. Oh yeah, uh, I'll make Billy you, Mays. I'll make yeah, I'll make you rich in real estate, and it would be like a two hour show, right? Where he would 
do all this pitch for how to make you rich in real estate. Oh, yeah, yeah. And really, it was the same old thing. I'll make you rich by showing you how to tell people how to get rich by telling people how to get rich. And someone buys a timeshare. And someone buys a timeshare. <laughs> and uh, anyway, this guy thought, well, hang on a second. The cost of this time late at night is nothing. Really, what? He told me once it was something like 100 bucks an hour. It was really, really cheap. Good Lord. And he said... Well, instead of putting some crappy infomercial on, why don't I put a show on and then sell commercials to sponsors just like any other show? Hmm. Right. So he and his uh, son wrote this sitcom. And uh, I somehow, oh, the ad was on Craigslist. <laughs> and, and back then, lots of great jobs were on Craigslist. Big jobs. Yeah, Craigslist has changed shape. I got the Geico Gecko off Craigslist. Um Tell, all right, well, I hate to differ. You got to tell me how that worked then. There was an ad on Craigslist um, pitching for an audition for Pandor for an ad on Pandora for the Geico Gecko. Oh, no, no. Sorry, I take it back. For ads on Pandora in general. Uh, so Pandora was advertising for their pool of VO actors. Uh, so I applied to that and I got taken on in their pool. And I'd done a couple of ads for them uh, previously and then Geico wanted to run an ad on Pandora. So they came to me because they thought I would be suitable for it. Uh, and they didn't want to use the union guy who does the TV ads. Right. Uh, because back then Pandora was small and I think it was a test market for Geico. And whatever the reasons, either the guy didn't couldn't do it, there was a union issue, or they just didn't want to spend the money on the union guy. Right. Uh, they, uh, they picked me. And so I got to help save people 15% on their car insurance on Pandora for a little, <laughs> for a little while. Um, and How so far into fun. the VO career were you there? Oh, that was three years in, four years in, three or four years in, yeah. So not too far in. So that was a nice little thing. And, but you know what's really weird about that? Every for years, I would just do a job, move on, do a job, move on, do a job, and not think about it afterwards. Right. Because it is very much you've got to keep banging on doors to get work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I never, ever used that as a calling card until recently. I never said, oh, you know what? I've been the Geico Gecko. Oh, and I've also been Ghost from Call of Duty. Oh, and I've also been... I never did any of that. Um, it just never occurred to me to do it until after this uh, regular job that I'd had for five years finished and I had to go back into the market, which was beginning of 2021, I thought, oh, blimey, I have to go market myself again. I hate that. Yes. How am I going to do that? And I went, well, let's see, what, it, what have I done? And finally it clicked. Oh, you've done some big things. You need to tell people about those big <laughs> things. And honestly, it just never occurred to me before because I was too busy knocking on doors trying to get work to actually think about you know, doing that. Right, and you weren't working with a manager at that point who would have been... <sighs> Managers uh, really aren't much use in this world. Right. Uh, in today's world, managers and agents don't really do much unless you're a marquee talent, an A-list actor. Right. Um, you have to have some agents because that's where the big work goes. Some of the and you know it's like the lottery. You have to play the lottery, you know, but don't spend more than a dollar on it because it's the same odds a dollar or a hundred dollars. Right. Effectively. Yeah. So, that, but so put your quick pick in for a dollar. And you might win the lottery. Similarly, get a few agents and they'll send you some of the big jobs and you'll audition for them. And if you're lucky, you might pick up one every 10 years. But they're not going to keep you uh, fed. Uh, in today's world for VO, you've got to get out there and find the work yourself. And the pay-to-play sites sort of cannibalized the freelance. And the pay-to-play sites did cannibalize it and, the, and they did. Did, but they also provide a good training gr ground for people. And if you're a client, you know, I can't, you know, it must be fantastic because um, <clears throat> me, I think it's a, a whole backward system. As it, when you go to a, a, apply to a job, when you turn up at the interview for a regular job, you don't pay them for the privilege of interviewing, <laughs> right? This is true. But that's what pay to play sites is. I'm, look, I'm trying to get a job, but you want me to pay for that. You have to pay A, a subscription to get on the pay-to-play site, and B, uh, every job, they take a cut. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't mind them taking a little cut, but it should be out of the client's money. It should be the client that pays for, just like an employer pays for uh, advertising to hire people, a client should pay for advertising to hire a VO. But it is what it is. Yeah. See, well, so, is, is that partly what led you to starting to look on Craigslist and things like that? Uh, uh, well, I mean, Craigslist was always a part of my, tr what I call trawling uh, back in the day, but um, uh, partially. Uh, but it very quickly became apparent that it's not efficient and not effective working in that manner. And as I said, marketing directly to people, the end users, is what's proving to be the most effective um, in, in, my, in my opinion. But yeah, from a client's point of view, let's say you want a vo voiceover for whatever. Yeah. Um, you've got your script. You know what it's for. You can just post it on a site and go, yeah, send me some you know, voices for that. And you can then listen to 100 voices if you want and just pick the one that suits your, your need. And that works for a lot of people. It doesn't work for some uh, clients because uh, the pay-to-play sites aren't very, uh, they don't, what's the word? They don't test the talent very yeah, well. Yeah, they don't vet the they skill of people. They don't vet the skill. So uh, you have to listen to a lot of crap to get to anything. Either poorly read or poorly recorded or yeah. some combination of the two. Exactly. Uh, and I once did a test on this. I wanted to see what it was like. So I posted a job, uh, a fake job. <laughs> and uh, uh, I wanted to hear what was coming back. And 50% of what was coming back, the quality was just dreadful. Um, so they weren't recording in a decent space. They weren't using a decent microphone. So you could just write them off immediately. Um, of the other 50%, I would say 70% of those couldn't read um, or couldn't read a script properly. And possibly 10% was professional. Um, so you've got to sort through a lot of chaff to get to the wheat right. as a client. And so, but for some people, uh, that suits them. But I, I think the market is turning again now. Uh, and both clients and talent have turned away from the pay-to-play sites because they don't work in the favor of the voiceover artist. Um, they don't really work in the favor of the client in many cases. Um, they only work in favor of the site owners. Right. Uh, and so people are, are, are realizing that and clients are now uh, going to different avenues to find their talent and talent are going directly to clients now more and more. So you had uh, an agent when you were looking for doing some acting. You have not had any agent for doing your voiceover. Now you, you're just fully freelance doing everything yourself, no, correct? Uh, when I went, when I came back to, um, oh wait, let's go back to, uh, let me, fi what was I finishing off on the acting, right? Yeah. I did, we did this uh, sitcom thing with this guy uh, who was trying to put it on late at night and that was great fun. And I realized very much that I like being on camera, but it's so hard to get any regular work doing that. Mm -hmm. um, he ended up not paying us in the end, so that was fun. <laughs> um, go figure. Go figure. Uh, but I also did a movie where they did pay me, um, uh, and that was fun too. Uh, but I couldn't generate enough on-camera work to justify the time spent going out looking for it, whereas with VO, I could. I could... Uh, by that point in time, I knew how to find the work and I knew that if I knocked on X number of doors, I would get X number of jobs. And so it was almost like math. I knew Just as, long as, I worked, of it. as long as I worked hard enough, I would get enough coming in. And then I lucked into this job with this website with their top 10 lists and that carried me for five years. So when that all ended in end of 20, tw beginning of 21, uh, I had to go back into the market and start all over again. Uh, and so I've been out marketing to people again. And I did recently, a couple of months ago, go out to pick up some agents because all my old agents had died off or I was, no, I was no longer getting anything from them. Right. And I, so I have picked up a couple of agents that are proving to be quite, quite uh, useful in as much as they're sending me auditions uh, on a somewhat regular basis. But let's say I picked up six uh, agents in this last round. Two of them are sending me work. And that's common uh, in the industry. 
So you can't rely on, and, and well, they're not sending me work, they're sending me auditions. Yeah. Um, and I've yet to book any work from them. And that's common in the industry too. So as a talent, you can't rely on agents to get work. You have to get out there and either be very lucky or very successful on pay to play or apply to every job that's out there on every job site and be lucky or market very effectively and be lucky. Well, if you market effectively, it's not about luck, then it's a numbers game. Yeah. If you market effectively, you will get work, period. Well, this is back to the soap thing. If you put two million in, we can probably get our money out. Yeah, exactly. So you took a five-year break from having to market yourself when you were doing exclusively the website work? Yes. Okay, so talk to me about what changed in that time. It had to look a little bit different when you came back, yeah? Oh, enormous. Uh, I hate it. <laughs> the whole world has changed. And back... In prior to, to, to this job, um, I understood the online world. I understood websites. I understood email. Now, that doesn't exist. Mm. It's apps and uh, it's social media. Mm -hmm. And when I went looking for jobs back then, some of the, as I told you, some of the nicest jobs were on Craigslist. And so you could just search Craigslist and pick up some decent work on a regular basis. There's nothing on Craigslist now. So I'm like, uh, where's all the work? Right. I went to all my usual sites, all the freelancer sites. There's nothing of any interest out there. Fiverr kind of took that out, huh? Fiverr took some of it out. But again, Fiverr's effectively, you know, you could add it as a string to your bow if you were so inclined. But to be efficient and effective on, fi on Fiverr, uh, the time required is too much. And I think uh, you're unlikely to be successful on Fiverr. Set up a profile, let it run, but don't uh, think you're going to get make a living off it. You might pick up some work there. Direct marketing is the way to go. But there's got to be work somewhere online. And right. I'm searching around for it. And guess where I found it? Twitter. Really? I don't even understand how Twitter works. And, and yet this is where I'm finding work. People are posting big jobs on Twitter. Really? And I'm like, what are you thinking? Why on earth would you think that there would be voiceover artists looking for work on Twitter? No kidding. I wouldn't even And even if there are, how do you go about finding them or, or making sure they see your post? Right. But I think what happened was the young people who are now Gosh, you sound like an old man now, right? <laughs> but the youth of today. <laughs> these kids. The youth, these kids, right? They do what they know. Right. And so they grew up on Twitter. They grew up on Instagram. They grew up on TikTok, whatever. And so when they need something now, that's where they go. And yeah, so it's bizarre. I know Twitter. Oh, yeah. I'm now a um, casting agent for, for Disney. I'm going to post, my, literally, Disney. I'm going to post my job on Twitter. And I'm like, really? How do you even, how does one find that? Don't know. I'm stumbling at the moment. I've, I've kind of making it up as I go along. And I know if you do hashtag this and hashtag that, <laughs> I can generate searches that bring up some of this stuff. Right. But I have yet to figure out how to effectively and comprehensively search all VO jobs on Twitter. And that's where a lot, lot of them are. LinkedIn has some too, and that's a little bit less opaque. Um, uh, and LinkedIn is a little bit easier to work with. But yeah, this is what happened. You're absolutely right. I came back into the world, and the world had changed dramatically. Yeah, that was a significant five years in media in general. Massive, massive. It messed things up for me completely. On the plus side, um, the world of casting changed uh, such that... For very, very big jobs, you had to be in L.A. or New York. And it didn't matter that you were sending in your audition remotely from your home studio because 10 years ago we all had home studios. Right. But they wanted you to come into the studio for the job. So if you were booked, they, want, they wanted you in L.A. or New York or London or whatever. Or Atlanta if you're lucky. Or Atlanta if you're lucky. Um, but that changed with COVID because everybody uh, – went remote with COVID and all the big studios, uh, recording studios, uh, developed fabulous efficient systems for recording high quality uh, VO remotely. 
And so when COVID kind of died off and became less of an issue, um, many of them still retained that and said, well, we don't need to limit ourselves to people that are in the, in the location. We can record people anywhere in the world. Uh, and you can. I mean, the technology is very simple and very easy. And is and that, that an changed. ISDN? No. Oh. Uh, it used to be ISDN. Um, but that is now a technology that even the phone company doesn't understand. Okay. Um, That's where I left off. Yeah. It's so old-fashioned now that, that it's, it's almost obsolete. There are very, very few people, if any, I haven't seen it actually asked for for a long time. Uh, you know, there's no client that asks for ISDN now. That's crazy. What they'll ask for is uh, one form or other of uh, voiceover internet uh, high quality. The big ones are Source Connect or IPDTL or Connection Open. That, but there's a dozen, more than a dozen. Okay. Uh, uh, companies now that run specifically software to enable you to record me when I'm in London. Full quality. Full quality, yeah. And sometimes with, with Source Connect, it's just my microphone and I'm recording into your drive um, directly uh, with Source Connect, for example. That's and, wild. And IPDTL. Um, they're basically just, you know, a high quality, high bandwidth connection to your home studio. Uh, and that's and so that what that did what that did was that opened up um, all the big jobs to anyone. Uh, so once upon a time, I thought I had to go to LA, and I spent a week there. Uh, we were living in De uh, Fort Worth, Dallas Fort Worth area at the time, and uh, I like LA, sunny, right? So I went over there and all the time again um, because I'm so OCD. Uh, I had a list of 50 properties I'm going to look at. <laughs> and I went to see all of them in two days. Dang. And uh, because it was very easy to write them off. Uh, because uh, in, I don't know how, much, how well you know LA. I know. lived there. Okay, for how long? A little, oh, almost two years. Okay. I then, lived right in West Hollywood. Then you know it better than me. Most of LA is a shithole. Yeah, and, <laughs> unfortunately, and apparently worse now. And uh, it, it, it was just horrible. I would go to a... a a house or an apartment or some houses. We weren't looking at apartments then, but uh, I would go to a house and I would go, I'd never step outside of this place because I'd get shot, right? And they want three times as much as I'm paying in Fort Worth. So for a lovely house. And so two days I did this and uh, I phoned my wife and I said, look, I don't care. Look, yes, this is where all the work is. And at the time I was trying to get on camera work. But honestly, I just couldn't drop my quality of life to this level <laughs> at this point in my life. Had I been younger, then maybe. But, you know, at this point, I'm in my 40s. And I'm like, I'm not dropping my quality of life now. Mm -mm. But if I was 20, yeah, I'd go live in a sub dump in L.A. and try and... Even then, it the isn't board. great. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure it's not fun, but at least you're prepared to do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When you're younger. I wasn't prepared to do it, so... No, I you can't downgrade. Back. So I came back and, I, you know, I did my best wherever wherever we were. And, you know, fortunately with home studios, uh, you know, you can move around and we've, we've been able to take, I've been able to take my work wherever the world has taken us. I've taken it to, I've taken my mic and my um, interface and my computer to London with me uh, when I went to visit family and set up in my mum's spare room with a bunch of cloth around me and done work that I had to be done that I couldn't put off. Uh, Perfectly fine there. The old tried and true method of some yeah, comforters. The old tried and true method of comforters. Uh, and I've done that. But yeah, th with the technology now that's changed, bigger jobs are available to people anywhere in the world. Um, and that, that also uh, is true with on-camera work now. Uh, yeah. In COVID, the on-camera audi on, on auditions went remote too. And so they are still open to that now. So in theory... If I wanted to go back and pitch for on-camera work, and I do occasionally uh, pitch on some on-camera work, uh, I can do the audition remotely. So it's not wasting half a day um, for a one in a hundred chance of getting a job or less with some of these jobs uh, of, of doing that. So at least I can justify spending the time because I'm just shooting myself, right, doing a short audition, sending it in, and if I win, I win. If I lose, 
no big deal. Not so much so, of a yeah, no harm, yeah. no foul situation. So that's kind of interesting. And, and I'd like to do some more of that. I'd like to get better at editing video because that's what takes the time when doing these things. And that's what puts me off with doing a lot of the, uh, the newer work that's coming out now. Um, obviously, content is king online. Mm -hmm. And the market has exploded for voiceover. But it's also exploded for on-camera people too. And I'd like to do some on-camera work. Um, there's all kinds of stuff. There's people that want you to do presentations and uh, promote products or, or give right. training. Uh, there's lots of uh, educational and training work online too where they want you on camera as well, either in front of a green screen and they'll fix that, do the background themselves or um, – you know, just a, a neutral kind of professional background they want you to do in front of your camera. And I'm quite good at that kind of stuff too, and I'd quite enjoy that. But uh, I've got to get faster editing because otherwise... Then, yeah. Then otherwise you're just spending so much time. There's a cost benefit there. There's a cost profit balance. It's the diminishing yeah. returns bit. And if I was great at editing, uh, which I am with audio, I can edit audio really fast. Um, but if I was as good at editing uh, video as I am at audio, there's tons of work that I should and could be applying for, but maybe I'll get there when. Yeah, know. I know that life. I had yeah. to offload it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this has all been super interesting, and I think we can have another conversation here, but I want to get you out on something fun maybe. Oh, cool. Tell me what your favorite voice was you got to do mm. and what voice you would do if you could do any, what gig you could take if you'd do any. Hmm. <clears throat> The favorite voice, uh, I mean, it's too easy to say uh, the gecko, uh, but that was fun doing the Geico gecko, and I can do him in my sleep, so it's a bit nice. <laughs> but I also enjoyed, I got to do, again, uh, I was the second fiddle for um, Ghost from Call of Duty, the video game. Mm -hmm. uh, they were doing a promo uh, movie for, I think, the release of Call of Duty 3, and once again, for whatever reason, Union Guy can't do it. So they asked me to do it. So I get to be a bit of a tough guy for a change. I don't often do tough guy <laughs> stuff. Hallway, clear, nine banger, and all that kind of stuff. Nice. And that was fun. Um, and honestly, uh, I kind of like, uh, I don't really do this per se, but I, I keep getting asked, and I've done it three or four times, once for an, uh, an e-learning uh, job. They like me to talk a bit like uh, C-3PO, from Star Wars, and I find that quite a fun voice too. It's not exactly an impression, but it kind of gives you the flavor of that kind of guy, the robot chap. And, nice. Uh, I like doing characters. Anything character that's funny, I, I enjoy doing. And most. you have developed some of your own characters, right? Oh, loads of characters of mine, uh, all kinds of stuff. Um, but mostly I'm stealing from uh, Monty Python. I keep going back to Monty Python and I'm stealing. Uh, right, 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 yes, 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 all that kind of stuff. And, um, I, I you can't do like, mess with the classics. Yeah, I they do like right there. I do like the uh, comedy characters. That's my favorite stuff. So, if you could do anything, would it be one of your own characters? Or honestly, I, I, I wouldn't mind. Um, character work is is uh, more strenuous. Um, so, if I could do anything at all, if that's the question, yeah. If I could do anything at all, here's what I've, I've come to at this point in life, and I don't know whether it's to do with this point in life or what, but I want to perform. I enjoy performing, but my ideal would be to perform with purpose. So what form that takes, I don't know, but let's say off the top of my head, let's say there's a nonprofit, some kind of charity that's producing a ton of content and they need someone voice on camera or whatever, or, or a whole bunch of them, non-profits. Right. If I could work for good causes doing what I do and love, then that would be, without having to go trawling for work. Yeah, right. Then that would be my dream. Well, amen to that. That's yeah. awesome. I right. love that. Well, Andrew, I had a blast getting to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you too. so much for coming down, it. man. I can't my wait pleasure. to see you again. Thank Love you so to. much, sir. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.